once again, welcome back for session number two. My name is Edward Jensen. I'm the pastor over at Grace Reform Presbyterian, one of the churches helping to host this. I'm excited to see so many faces here, many that I, I recognize, many that I would like to get to know you better. Um, but it's my pleasure now to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Daryl, or D.G. Hart. I guess it depends on how well you know him as to which one you call him by. But uh, he was a professor for a while at, at Westminster, California. He ran away before I got a chance to take one of his classes and has now found his way to Hillsdale College, where he's a visiting professor. He's an elder in the OPC, and he's taught at Wheaton, Westminster Theological Seminary, at Westminster Seminary, California. Some just say Westminster West, Westminster East, but they prefer to go by the, their full names. <laughs> Uh, he's written extensively. He has several books out there that he's edited. He's written on evangelicalism, the history of Presbyterianism, the OPC, and everything else from here and back again. And so um, some of his more recent books are from Billy Graham to Sarah Palin, Evangelicals, and the Betrayal of American Conservatism. So there's lots of good stuff that I'm sure you'll have questions for him later. But now please welcome uh, Dr. Daryl Hart. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction. You can hear this, okay? I feel like this is going to fall off at some point. Um, is this, it, it is on, is that right, or not? Okay, no, yes. I can't really tell. <laughs> okay, um, so we're talking about being reformed in America, and we're go going to talk a lot about what it means to be reformed, but thinking about what it means to be in America, uh, maybe should also be, say a few words about that by way of int introduction, especially <coughs> thinking about uh, something called Americanism, which for Roman Catholics becomes a heresy at a certain point in Roman Catholic history. So what is American? Is it the government of the United States? Um, is it the people of the United States? Is it the place, the actual borders, the, 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 the land of the United States? And we, Hillsdale College, we actually spent a fair amount of time talking about these, uh, what it means to be an American in, in our course, American Heritage. Um, do any of these particular matters pose problems for Christianity? Say, the government of the United States, or the people of the United States, or the, the land, in particular the United States? But we also think about some other things about what it means to be American. Uh, if you travel overseas at all, and I've been fortunate to do that of late, um, even going to Turkey with one of the Hillsdale uh, student groups, um, fast food is something that maybe we're not proud of, but that's something that's pretty uniquely American. Um, the Super Bowl is also something that's uh, uniquely American. Um, Back in 1994, I was teaching at a Presbyterian seminary in Brazil uh, for a, a winter term course, and my wife and I were there when the Super Bowl was being played, and we could actually watch it. Yes, we were breaking the Lord's Day. So that, that does raise a problem for Christians if you're a Sabbatarian, the Super Bowl. Skyscrapers are sometimes sort of uniquely American. If you look at European cities, they still have very low uh, buildings. Um, and uh, then there are cars. Americans have, um, have uh, many more opportunities for cars and use cars much more than other people, at least comparing uh, Americans to Europeans. Um, and then there's sort of the American character. We're very friendly and unassuming people, generally speaking, but we're also very informal. Um, and that sometimes puts Europeans off if they're coming from a more formal or hierarchical uh, society or culture. And if, you, if you've watched Downton Abbey, for instance, and probably some of you have, I mean, there's, Americans sort of like that, that hierarchy. There's even a hierarchy with the downstairs as opposed to the upstairs. Um, but, but Americans generally don't like hierarchy, so it, maybe that affects our character in some way. Um, and then, uh, thinking about just driving out here today, Americans drive on the right side of the road, as do the English. I mean, sorry, as do the French and other people, but the English do not. So is that, that's not uniquely American, but 
it is something you would have to adjust to if you're coming here from a culture that, that didn't drive on the right-hand side. Um, language, the language here, we all take for granted, all of us here who are English speakers, but immigrants who come to the United States cannot take that for granted. The German and Dutch Reformed churches that come here couldn't take that for granted, and that becomes a crisis for these churches when they actually get to a point where they have to implement or think about implementing English-speaking services. Um, do Americans have particular views about women? And the, here again, the kind of equality that America sometimes champion has meant that we believe in an equality between men and women. But in particular communions represented here, the OPC and the URC, women are not ordained. So, th and our churches look un-American in some ways for that reason. One last example is the flag. How many of our churches actually have an American flag at the front? And when did American flags actually become part of um, the service? And, or, I mean, part of the, the, um, the worship space? Actually, World War I is the short answer to that. When many uh, German and Dutch churches needed to show that they were patriotic during the war and prove it by putting up flags in the church. So... These are just a few of the ways of thinking about then what, what it is that's American and, and whether or not Christians have to adjust to American culture or American government or the American people. Um, now again, some Christians have had m much more trouble adjusting and the Roman Catholics were one group that, that did so. And in fact, um, in, in the 19th century, there was a controversy. There, Dr. Strange mentioned earlier the whole notion of papal supremacy that developed in the high Middle Ages. But in the 19th century, particularly after the French Revolution, the papacy almost doubled down on papal supremacy so that by the, the first Vatican Council, that's when you have the first dogmatic declaration of papal infallibility. And part of that was to still protect the power of the papacy, which was eroding very much politically during the uh, 19th century. And so there was a controversy in France among French Roman Catholics between people called the Gallicanists, those who were supporting more of a French church, a French Roman Catholic church, more autonomy for the French bishops, versus the Ultramontanists. Those were the people who looked over the mountains toward Rome and wanted to assert, wanted the papacy to assert itself within the French church. And they more or less, that controversy between those two groups, led uh, the papacy eventually to take a stand against Americanism. And Pope Leo XIII, in an encyclical uh, named Testem Benevolentiae Nostrae, it's been a long time since I had Latin, so forgive me if I'm mispronouncing. Um, and, and Leo is, is significant because he's considered sort of the first pope who, who starts Roman Catholic social thought or teaching but they don't often include this encyclical part of his social teaching, which was to condemn Americanism and make it a heresy. And um, I'll say more about what that me but it, what it meant, but it, in, a, in a nutshell, it meant that the American church, American Roman Catholic church, should not adjust or adapt to American norms. And it, the church, the papacy wanted to refuse to do this, and it took until the 1960s until the Second Vatican Council for, for Roman Catholics in, in the United States finally to come to terms and be comfortable in America, be comfortable in their American skin. <clears throat> um, and one of the people who helped them do that uh, was John Murray, not the OPC's John Murray, but another John Murray, by the full name of John Courtney Murray, who actually had to write under a pseudonym for a while in, during the 1950s because his views were so objectionable still to the papacy. But eventually his views prevailed at the Second Vatican Council, and part of what Murray did was to make a case that natural law understandings of society and politics were written into the Declaration of Independence, and that became a way for Roman Catholics to embrace the American founding. 1776. But again, it takes until 1960 for that to happen, and if any of you are old enough to have remembered, and I don't really remember even though I'm old enough, President Kennedy, when he was running for, for 
presidency in 1960, had to go before uh, uh, Baptist ministers in Texas to explain why he was going to be loyal to the Constitution and not to the papacy. That was the kind of pressure that was still brought to bear upon Roman Catholics, partly because the papacy itself had insisted that there was something flawed in the American way of government. Um, and, and Dr. Strange, again, sort of would help us exp explain that because they believed in this notion of the church is above the state in some way, and of course that's not the way American government worked. But, so that's just the way of, of setting up uh, though the, the question of whether Americanism has been a problem for Protestants. Um, and I would say that, generally speaking, most Protestants feel fairly comfortable with, with the government of the United States and fair, feel fairly comfortable with America, some so comfortable to insist that America had a Christian founding. Um, and I don't necessarily want to go into that tonight. Um, but as Dr. Strange also uh, argued earlier from the 18th century Presbyterian experience, Presbyterians had to readjust their confession of faith um, in 1789 when they revised the Westminster Confession on the nature of the magistrate. One of the, the original form of the Westminster Confession of Faith from 1646 or whenever the, that piece of the Westminster Assembly's work was finished. Chapter 23 said that the magistrate did not was not allowed to preach, not allowed to administer the supper, not allowed to hold the keys of the kingdom, meaning not allowed to get, engage in discipline. So there was an effort to try to preserve some authority for the church specifically when it came to excommunication. That was a big issue in the Erastian controversy, whether it was the state that excommunicated or the church that excommunicated. So the original Westminster Confession did not give excommunicated excommunicative powers to the magistrate. But what they did say was that the magistrate may, or call councils, may sit at church councils, and may ensure that the church councils are conforming to the word of God. Now, it's pretty easy for us to think, probably, I'm assuming many of us here are more comfortable with the GOP than the Democratic Party, although I don't necessarily need to make, necessarily need to make that assumption, but I think a lot of Christians today would have some problems with Barack Obama, the president, calling the General Assembly the OPC and sitting at it and making sure that our General Assembly conforms to the Word of God. But how much would we really be comfortable with George Bush doing that? I'm not sure I'd be real, real comfortable with that either. But that was the kind of power granted in the Westminster Confession to the magistrate. <clears throat> um, it's interesting that we typically only t tend to think of the president's powers when it comes to this. But what about the governor of Michigan, Rick Snyder, where I come from? Could he call a presbytery of Michigan and Ontario and preside over that in some way and make sure that it conformed to um, teachings of scripture? Or how about the mayor of Hillsdale, uh, Brian Watkins? I had to look up his name. Um, <laughs> could he call the, pr the session of the local OP ch church there and say, preside over that? But that's sort of what's involved here with the original Westminster Confession of Faith and why Presbyterians revised it so that um, that language was removed. Um, okay, so that's a way of trying to uh, set up one version of an Americanist controversy. And it happens, I would argue, in some ways you could look at it this way, in the old school, new school controversy of the 19th century among American Presbyterians. Uh, this talk, I think, in the literature at one point was maybe going to include Dutch Reformed and German Reformed in this. But it's really not the case that the German and Dutch Reformed feel the pressures of Americanism until the 20th century. So in the 19th century, it's the American Presbyterians who are feeling it. So if you're getting a lot of dose of Presbyterianism tonight, uh, Dr. Strange and I probably both apologize for that. But, but it does help to illustrate this point about ways in which the American environment might shape the church and why that might be a problem. So the old school, new school um, controversy, which leads to a split in the church in 1837, is one way, uh, is one version perhaps of an Americanist controversy, a Protestant one and not a Roman Catholic one. And this relates to 
the second great awakening. I prefer to call it the second pretty good awakening. I think we throw around the word great a little bit too much. Um, and, and in this particular case, some might even say that the second no good awakening. But, um, but w one of the, one of the uh, key figures of the second great awakening was Charles Finney. Now, generally speaking, in Calvinist circles, everybody boos at the mention of the name of Finney. And for good reason, for, because his theology was, was quite Arminian. But one of the things to notice about Finney's theology, and I'm going to do, make this in a broad uh, point, is that it was a kind of democratic theology. He emphasized a lot the importance of people voting or choosing for Jesus. He very much picked up on the language of Jacksonian democracy in his appeal to people. Um, and I'll say more about the theology of the New School, and Finney was originally associated with the New School, though he eventually becomes a Congregationalist, I guess. And he, he he's a professor of um, moral, moral philosophy at Oberlin College, and eventually the president of Oberlin College in Ohio. But also, um, Finney's associated with, with things called the new measures. And again, are these distinctly American uh, endeavors, or are they something else? But they're not Presbyterian, and this was part of the problem for Finney. So uh, he would pray for people by name from the pulpit. He would go into towns without invitations from the local preachers or sessions. Uh, he uh, wanted to admit converts immediately into, into church membership rather than having some kind of time of, of training. Um, he had protracted meetings. He had exhortations in these meetings from women, but probably the most notable new measure of Finney was the anxious bench, which is sort of the beginning of the altar call. So at the front of the church was a bench where people who were feeling under conviction at the end of the sermon would come forward and sit and receive counsel or prayer. And if you've ever seen the Billy Graham crusade, which is becoming harder to remember or harder to see because they're no longer going, but, but there would be this mass movement of people to the front, and this was sort of what Finney initiated. <clears throat> um, and one of the better critics of, of uh, Finney's new measures, John Williamson Nevin, uh, actually had a very uh, interesting reading on the, the anxious bench, bench and how manipulative it could be. And in my own experience growing up in a Baptist church, I would say, yeah, I mean, it could be very manipulative because my, own, my wife's experience in a Baptist church, her father was a Baptist pastor, and if he would have an altar call and no one was going forward, sort of like the kids are thinking, come on, I mean, you've got to show some kind of support for the pastor. Maybe I'll go forward, so at least somebody. But that could lead to problems at home if a child goes forward. with. But even, I mean, I was thinking, okay, I, you know, I really sh probably should go forward to show that I'm dedicated again or rededicate my life or something, but I don't really feel like it, but I feel like I should. I mean, so the kind of mental gym or psychological gymnastics that go on in that, Nevin was, was very perceptive in seeing in the 1840s. Um, and he was also a scientific guy, not in the, in the modern sense, but he believed that there was a science of revivals, that if you set up revivals a certain way, the right amount of time, the right air temperature in the room, the right lighting, all these right uh, atmospherics, you would have a conversion. So it was really taking the power of conversion away from God and giving it to men, which of course raised a real problem for Calvinists who believe in the sovereignty of God, particularly in the salvation of sinners. <clears throat> so that's one aspect of the second pretty good awakening that uh, may reflect American kinds of developments. But another aspect of it, one that we probably don't think about uh, enough, is something called the Benevolent Empire. This was a series of voluntary associations that people who generally supported the revivals were uh, setting up all over the United States. They generally started in either New York or New England and then spread across America. And these voluntary societies were both religious and social slash political. In the religious category fell things like Bible societies. Some of the earliest ones were founded in 1809. But there were already tra also tract societies, which produced cheap literature. Of course, Bibles were cheap, produced cheaply so that every home and perhaps eventually every uh, hotel room could have a Bible. Um, but tract societies, too, educational literature distributed cheaply. 
there were uh, education societies provide scholarships for men to go to seminary. There were the origins of Sunday schools. Sunday schools originally, though, were not teaching necessarily about Jesus in the Bible, but were actually teaching the three R's, reading, uh, writing, and arithmetic, because this, these were designed for children who could not go to school during the week, children who had to work. Um, and uh, then there were also moral reform societies, such as temperance. And temperance initially was trying to restrict people's uh, access to hard liquor. So wine and beer were, were fine for a while, but then eventually it became total abstinence. Um, and along with this was also anti-slavery societies in an effort to eliminate slavery from the United States, one of the great difficulties of the American founding and political history of the United States up, of course, to the Civil War, but then also race, rela race relations beyond that. Uh, and then there were also the founding of missionary societies, so efforts to try to evangelize both in the United States and around the world. Um, but in addition to these religious uh, societies, there were also efforts to try to uh, reform prisons and to reform diets. And there were just the reform was in the air. And a good side of this, one of the uh, dietary reforms, was the graham cracker. There was a graham cracker diet. And Sylvester Graham was a Presbyterian minister who advocated graham crackers as part of the diet. So if you like graham crackers, think of the benevolent empire uh, and thank um, Charles Grandison Finney, I guess. But, um, but also, it, it, I mean, there were all sorts of experiments. But one, I mean, this had a positive side in that the United States was a new nation. And part of the European experience of nationhood and the institutions that gave Europeans political order and stability were the crown, monarchy, and the church, particularly bishops and the papacy. America starts without either the crown or the, or the bishop. So how is America going to achieve some kind of social order? And many of the, these societies that Americans established during this time were responsible, and many mainstream historians have argued this, responsible for giving America cohesion and order. So they had a positive side, but it also tempted the people promoting the benevolent empire to think that they were Christianizing the United States and that the kingdom of God was actually going to be established in the United States. So there's a very post-millennial view behind these revivals. Um, and, and, and that establishing the kingdom of God in the United States could lead to some kind of association of the United States with the kingdom of God. Uh, which could breed a kind of nationalism that might be dangerous if you think of your nation as the kingdom of God. Not necessarily under God's rule, but as the kingdom of God in some way. So that's one of the elements that is feed, going to feed this Americanist controversy. And you could argue that the, the gr second Pretty Good Awakening and the Benevolent Empire were ways that made or Americanized Christianity for this new environment, this new nation. Now, the controversy specifically that led to the split in the Presbyterian Church came uh, sort of the, 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 um, the lightning rod, as it were, was a sermon preached by Albert Barnes, a Presbyterian minister, graduate of Princeton Seminary, of all things, um, so Pres Prin Princeton was producing people on both sides. Um, how well he, 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 his grades were, I don't know, or how good his grades were. But it also makes the point about, um, generally speaking, anything that comes out of New York City in Presbyterian circles is not good. Maybe even Edwards, I could fit into that, but I, I, won't, I won't go. Um, but, the, but the beginning of the modernist fundamentalist controversy also starts with a sermon in New York City. Um, so. Barnes preached the sermon, The Way of Salvation. And in this sermon, among other things, he said, Christianity does not say, as I suppose, that the sinner is held to be personally answerable for the transgressions of Adam or of any other man, or that God has given a law which man has no power to obey. Such a charge and such a requirement would be most clearly unjust. The law requiring love to God, supreme and unqualified, and love to man is supposed to be equitable, fully within the reach of every mortal, if there was a first, first a willing mind. So in effect, 
Barnes is denying original sin, um, or the imputation of Adam's sin to everyone. And it makes sense from Barnes' perspective to deny this, because if, if you're going to tell people that they're lost in sin and they can't follow the law of God, but you want the law of God to be the rule and norm for society to establish the kingdom of God in America, you've got a bit of a problem. Now, one way to resolve that is to convert people, but not everyone is necessarily going to be converted. So, so that's really one of the linchpins of Calvinism. Total depravity, in effect, is being denied by Barnes. And he wasn't, get it, he wasn't creating this by himself. Um, the, um, Barnes then goes, uh, he's in New York, he moves to Philadelphia. Philadelphia was always a much more conservative place for Presbyterians. And there he goes and makes some other inflammatory remarks. So he's eventually uh, tried uh, by the Presbytery of Philadelphia, a series of trials, some of which are appealed to the General Assembly. And I won't go into all those details, but Barnes is never convicted. And it's kind of a, sh a battle of shifting majorities in the, in the assemblies of the church, which allow Barnes to escape the law of the Presbyterian church. So finally, there is a break um, in 1837 where the old school had the majority at the assembly and um, it, at, it did three things at this general assembly. It abrogated a plan of union. There was a plan of union in 1801 between Presbyterians and Congregationalists for how they would plant churches in places like Iowa but also in places like Michigan. As they were expanding out to the west, they had a deal worked out with Congregationalists so that if a Congregational church called a Presbyterian how do you sort that out polity-wise? If a, if a Congregationalist church called a Presbyterian, how do you work that out? So the plan of union was about that, but it was a joint church planting effort. So the old school assembly abrogated that plan of union. It repudiated Presbyterian participation in many of the voluntary societies, especially the, um, the, the, the voluntary societies of the benevolent empire that were responsible for the more religious aspects such as um, tract societies or missionary societies. These were matters that Presbyterians believed should be under the oversight of ruling officers in the church, under the oversight of pastors and elders, under the oversight of assemblies and synods and, and presbyteries. Um, and so, you know, one of the real controversies, and, and we're still living with this to this day, that, that's coming out of this Second Great Awakening is the relationship between the church and the parachurch. Uh, how much can parachurch agencies do activities, perform activities that are really properly belong to the church? So evangelism, teaching, preaching, counseling, all sorts of things like that. Many, there are tons of parachurch agencies out there that do that, and the more stick-in-the-mud Presbyterians, and I myself, count myself as one of them, think that those sorts of activities, the ministry of the Word of God, needs to be under the oversight of ordained officers in the church. That's part of the, the way Presbyterians believe we do church, but also the way we believe you do ministry. So uh, that, was a, that was something then that the old school rejected, was Presbyterian participation in parachurch organizations. And then finally, the coup de grace of the 1837 General Assembly is to exclude all churches, presbyteries, and synods unwilling to abide by Presbyterian theology and polity. And so the 1837 General Assembly declared illegal all Presbyteries formed under the plan of union, which meant many of the Presbyteries in Western New York and Upper Midwest, and they excluded, now count this, 28 Presbyteries, 509 ministers, and 60,000 church members. That's Presbyterian church growth rate. I'm kidding. But it is, it does, it does illustrate what pres something that Reformed and Presbyterians do, which is church discipline. Is church discipline a mark of the church? And here, the old school was disciplining churches that were not congregations and presbyteries that were not of like faith and practice. And of course, why Presbyterians actually got into this plan of Union 1801 is a whole other matter. <clears throat> and so the old school and new school Presbyterian churches would remain separated for the next 
31 years, although it gets really complicated when you get the sectional crisis, and we m don't need to go into that tonight. It may come up tomorrow. Hold on to your hats. Uh, so um, w w one other point to mention about the, um, the, um, the theology that was at work in the uh, old school, new old school controversies, that um, Barnes himself and Finney was, were also picking up on trends in New England theology in the early 19th century. And some would call this the New Haven theology associated with Nathaniel William Taylor, who taught at Yale uh, Divinity School. And, um, and it, you know, it may be too much my trying to fit this talk into a certain theme of Americanism, but, but Barnes give, gives a flavor of this in his denial of the imputation of Adam's sin. That's just not an American notion that people come into the world without a chance to fulfill the law of God. Everybody has to have a chance. That's just not fair. We still hear that all the time today from people if you present them with the doctrines of grace in some way and the notion of total depravity and the, and the need for sovereign work of God for someone to come to Christ. That's just not fair. Election isn't fair. Election is what Americans do. It's what Finney was encouraging Americans to do. It's not what... God should do to, to us. So you can, in some ways, read, um, read the, th this new school, uh, old school controversy as an Americanizing of Presbyterian theology, but actually to the point where it's no longer Presbyterian. Um, so, so in effect, then, what the old school stood for, when you look at, at back, stand back from the controversy, the old school stood for Presbyterian polity, the idea that the church needs and her officers and assemblies need to oversee the ministry of the word, the ministry of sacraments and discipline. They also stood for Calvinistic soteriology as taught in the Westminster Standard, which is pretty clear about the five points of Calvinism for starters. And it was also very, it reflected a concern with what was happening in New England, with New England theology, but also with New England activism with the, the Great Awakening, or so-called Great Awakening. Um, what the New School stood for, and here someone like George Marson, very prominent historian, his first book was on the New School. He argues that what characterized the New School was that it was evangelistic, so we'll use any means possible to get the word out for, of Christ, and that's, that's a laudable endeavor to be sure, but again, are there constraints on the way that we do this by having calling men, having them ordained, having them overseen, having them trained in seminaries or not? So, so there's almost a kind of um, pragmatic nature, and the only school of philosophy that the United States ever produced was pragmatism. So that may be another thing that Americans are known for, is being pragmatic. The new school was certainly pragmatic in trying to get the gospel out. They were also nationalistic, though. As, as I said, they, they wanted to see America become a Christian nation and in some ways be a fulfillment of the kingdom of God. And then also they were committed to a voluntaristic principle, the idea that people voluntarily choose God, but that also people voluntarily become involved in these voluntary societies. And they were also uh, very much moralistic or at least stressed right conduct. That was going to be the, the, the ingredient that would make the United States a, a Christian place, is if people could obey the law of God, if they could follow God's teaching. And so what the New School tried to do was make the doctrines of Calvinism fit this idea that everybody needs to obey the law of God. Um, that's why the imputation of Adam's sin needed to be removed because that, didn't, that wasn't a game plan for getting people to be to observe uh, the law of God. So in, in that sense, I think it's possible to regard the, the um, old school, new school controversy as a, as a Presbyterian version of Americanism and, and the sort of struggles that the Roman Catholic Church herself was dealing with in the late 19th century when Pope Leo XIII condemned Americanism as a heresy. So, just to bring back Rome as I've just done, what would Rome say then about, for instance, the old school, new school controversy? Uh, Rome thought it knew what Americanism was, and so would they regard 
uh, the new school as more Americanist than the old school? Or from Rome's perspective, would both churches be Americanist in some way? Um, and, and one of the things um, we need to sort out in trying to answer this question is what did Rome mean by Americanism? And the encyclical that Leo XIII wrote in 1898 is hardly clear. And I think he was trying to avoid the controversy as much as possible, but the French church had sort of wound him up and he needed to respond to keep the French on board in some way. But one of the things that is, does stand out in this is the notion of the separation of church and state. And this goes back to Professor Strange, Strange's comments as earlier about the church being above the state. Of course, the United States represents a form of government that does not have the ch any church above the state. How the church and the state sort each other out and have a separation of some kind. Is it a wall of separation? How high is the wall? I mean, there are great debates about this. But clearly, from Rome's perspective, the American form of government was a serious uh, threat to, Amer to Roman Catholic life because of Rome's previous views about the relationship betwe between church and state. <clears throat> they were also opposed to democracy. If you read the documents of Trent or Vatican I, it's, and even down to Vatican II, the church is a very hierarchical church with the pope at the top, the bishops under the church, the, and the priests more or less assistance to the bishops, and then the lay people down below. It's still the hierarchy of the medieval church, very much there. Um, and so this democratic notion of the equality, the losing of ranks in society, we all get along, we slap each other in the back, we give each other high fives, all the informal, informality of America, <laughs> that's not the way you do this. And in fact, down to 1950, one of the last great books of anti-Catholicism in the, I'm sorry, pretty good books, of anti-Catholicism in America, Paul Blanchard's book, he, he, he makes it, has this line in there about Americans don't kiss a, 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 a priest's hand or a bishop's hand. Americans don't bow before any man. And, you know, in some ways you can almost understand the point because if you, if you, reach, if you watched any of the um, hoopla at the Vatican this past year with the selection of Francis, I mean, it's still a very hierarchical church. There's, I mean, they, the pope is still like a king. It's a monarchical form of government, and it doesn't sit well with Americans, nor, d at least at one point, did American form of government sit well with the papacy. And one other point to underscore this, not to mention uh, d democracy, but republicanism, small r, is, uh, we need to s say probably in the scope of human history, is an aberration. Most forms of government throughout the history of the world have been monarchical rule by one person. Uh, the Greeks, the Romans experimented with different kinds of uh, governments, but they didn't last very long. And so republicanism is an aberration, but particularly the way the papacy experienced republicanism in Europe with the French Revolution, which also kicked up a lot of dander for the Dutch Calvinists in the Netherlands. That's where you'd expect the Dutch Calvinists to be, I guess. But um, uh, the French Revolution was not kind to many Christians in, in Europe. And it was particularly unkind to the French church. And there were all sorts of oaths of loyalty to the new government in France that resulted in French uh, priests having to go into exile. Some of them were executed. It was, it was not, if you know anything about the reign of terror, it was not a pretty time in republican forms of government. And in many respects, the papacy and the Vatican read U.S. history or read American republicanism through the lens of what was happening in France. So republicanism was also another form of government that the, that the papacy didn't want to have anything to do with. And so there was a real fear in Rome of any kind of accommodation of the church to democracy and to republicanism. And that's part of the reason why uh, the church condemns Americanism as a heresy. Now, <clears throat> was the old school in any way condemning the American form of, of civil government in the old school, new school controversy? Um, you could say that it did, the old school did object to letting notions of equality and democracy and moral 
conviction of some kind, let that seep away at, at Presbyterian theology. But there was no, no references at all to American forms of government in the old school's concern about the new school. But is there anything greater at stake when it comes to Americanism? <clears throat> now, soon after the encyclical of 1898 uh, from the Vatican, uh, under uh, Leo's successor, Pius X, I believe, was the next pope, but if, it wasn't, if he wasn't the immediate successor, Pius X did, in 1907, issue an encyclical that condemned modernism. And the great theme, it's a very long encyclical, and one that many Roman Catholics today have no knowledge of or awareness of, and it's quite, it's quite striking. Uh, and it resonates, in many respects, with the kinds of concerns that fundamentalists would have about modernism as well, such as not uh, real concerns about Darwinism, real concerns about biblical criticism. Um, but one of the, um, the major themes of the encyclical is that the church should not adapt to modern thought and modern politics and modern culture. And so modernism is, in effect, an adaptation of Christianity to modern society or modern culture or modern intellectual life. And one of the um, great historians of mo Protestant modernism um, also made this same point, that one of the defining features of Protestant modernism was that it also adapted Protestantism to modern thought, so that when fundamentalists or confessional Presbyterians like J. Gresser Machen come along and object to modernism, again, there are sort of resonances here between what Rome is objecting to and what Protestants are objecting to. <coughs> Um, but it is still important to see that uh, the old school never objected to the American system of government or church and state. So in some ways, the old school never really sort of said, you know, we were wrong to revise our confession of faith or to adopt that form of government from which Dr. Strain uh, uh, read earlier. They never took any reservations about that. And um, one of the reasons I think we can say this is because in some ways, whether or not they, they said it specifically, the old school and other confessional Protestants, so we're meeting in a Missouri Synod facility, right? This is Missouri? No, it's not. It's ELCA? Oh, really? Okay. Um, but one, one of the striking uh, features about American political life and the, and the separation of church and state and the, the um, affirmation of religious freedom for all people is that it actually gave confessional Protestants, whether Reformed or Lutheran, much more freedom to pursue church life according to the standards of the Reformation than they had in the old world. So Presbyterian, old, old school Presbyterianism could not have happened in Scotland. It needed the kind of political freedom that the United States uh, allowed. Uh, because, for instance, again, Professor Strange already uh, mentioned this earlier, but in 1843, there is a secession or a disruption even of the Church of Scotland. The Free Church of Scotland starts in 1843, and it, it it goes back to a long controversy and rivalry in the Scottish church between local uh, civil authorities or wealthy patrons of the churches and the autonomy or freedom of the church, to, especially to call her own uh, pastors, but also to oversee her own affairs. And one of the things that I don't think people who sometimes may pine for Christendom or for older church-state relationships where the, church, the state would actively support and promote the church, which would mean in, in various contexts in the old world, even in Calvin's Geneva, that Calvin is being paid by the state. He's an, in some ways a civil servant, even though he's a spiritual servant. But he's, his, his, he doesn't have to take an offering. If they're taking an offering, it's for the support of the needy and the poor in town. It's, it's part of the alms. It's, but the, but the, the ministers are all being paid by the state. And guess what happens if someone's paying your salary? They get, it, they get to actually tell you what to do. They actually think they have some say in what you're doing. 
So the separation then of the church and state and, and going to a voluntary church where we actually ask people to give to support a work is actually a good thing. And again, this illustrates the point that confessional Protestants, like old school Presbyterians, had greater freedom to pursue a seriously uh, a serious-minded Presbyterian faith in the United States than they would have had in Scotland. So, um, by way of conclusion, and I'm not sure what time I started, but I'm still going to conclude because <laughs> it's getting a little late anyway. Uh, but I think I think it's about the right amount of time. It's a problem when you don't use a manuscript. You never know how long you're going to go. And when you're teaching a class, you can always pick it up the next day. I've got five minutes. Okay. Then I'll, I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm really close. Um, so going back to what I said, is America a threat to Christianity? Or how do Christians relate to things that make us American? And it really depends on what not so much of what America is, it depends on what we regard as crucial to our faith and practice as Christians. Um, and does the United States, or does American society, or do American norms and expectations, which are much more difficult to uh, put your finger on, but do any of those require us to give up aspects of church life or reform conviction that we find crucial? So does driving require something from us? Some of the examples I used at the beginning. Probably not. Food, fast food. Probably not. Language, not really. Uh, relations between the sexes or the, the status of women in the church. It might. Or schools is another one. Going to state-funded schools as opposed to homeschooling or private schools. Um, again, that's, that's a... That's a perhaps a dicey matter, but that's another way of trying to think about whether uh, being American takes something from us as Christians. Um, and I'll just close with one example of a, of a reform group uh, that, that did see a problem with the United States and its form of government, and that was the Covenanters. Uh, the Covenanters were uh, Presbyterians very serious Presbyterians, 17th century Scotland, who refused to join the Church of Scotland when it was reinstituted in 1690 because they were still committed, get this, to the covenant, hence the name Covenanters. The, the, the original covenant, 1581 in Scotland, which committed Scotland, the monarchy, the parliament, and the people to the true faith, which also meant opposing Roman Catholicism. That was the covenant that Covenanters insisted the church had to maintain and the Church of Scotland, as it was reinstituted in 1690, was not committed to that same covenant. So when covenanters come to the United States, they see that the United States doesn't have an acknowledgement of the Lord Jesus Christ in our Constitution. And so what that means for covenanters, they're not going to serve in the military. They're not going to vote in elections. And they're not going to run for office because they think the American form of government is, I don't know if they'd say illegitimate, some way. I don't think they would say illegitimate, but it's not something in which reformed Christians can participate. That changed in 1980. They no longer hold that view. But, you know, it's not just Anabaptists or Mennonites or Amish who, are, who ha he may hold that view. It, some reformed people actually held that view. But again, most of our Dutch and Scottish Presbyterian or, or Presbyterians coming out of that Scottish background have not held that view. We have actually revised our confessions on the matter of church and state. <clears throat> And so if that is what is America, our form of government, um, then maybe we should give at least one cheer, maybe two cheers for the kind of separation and freedom, separation of church and state and freedoms that we enjoy. I will stop there. I probably, well, I don't know if I wound anyone up at this late hour. So, uh, but I will take a few questions. I guess we have a couple minutes. <coughs> Um, I would say it's, it, it's, um, <clears throat> he's, he's too introspective. Um, I, 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 I just, when I read religious protection, I, um, <clears throat> I just don't measure up. 
but I don't see Jesus in that. So maybe that's not, not the best reading of Edwards, but, but I have to look for all this work in, inside of myself and that's just not where I want to go. <laughs> Nor does my wife want me to go there. So, if you know what I mean. So, thank you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, I think you could say that the, the second <clears throat> Pretty Good Awakening uh, could have contributed to that in some way, but, but I would say that it wasn't merely <clears throat> New School Presbyterians who were partaking of that ideology of the Manifest Destiny. All sorts of Americans were. Um, all sorts of secular figures were as well. So I don't think it was necessarily distinctly American. I mean, I think the problem would, have, would be how do New School Presbyterians uh, object to that, or do they side with it? I would think that, personally, I would object to it, but um, so, but I don't know that it was of necessarily a Christian provenance. So that's one reason, maybe, for not throwing it in. I, I, I love the beat up on the second Pretty Good Awakening and the Benevolent Empire, so if you can give me more ammunition, that's great, but yes. Well, I think uh, uh, Dr. Godfrey's idea of a federation, I think, is, is key. And, and we've lost a sense of what federalism is in the United States as you know, one of the consequences of uh, the way the Civil War played out and then all the things that 20th century threw at us. But federalism is a great idea of allowing autonomy of the states in some way under the umbrella of the Constitution. So, so you not only have a separation of powers between the three branches of the federal government, but you have this separation of power between the federal government and the states. And I think partly of what Dr. Goffrey is proposing is a kind of federalism of the Reformed Church. So I think I actually would like to see that happen. But specifically, I mean, you know, the OPC and the URC are cooperating now on, on producing a Psalter hymnal. So we can, we can at least do that. We've also... I mean, between 1956 and 1972, the OPC and the, UR and the CRC were pursuing a church union, a merger of the two denominations. It didn't work out, but it wasn't necessarily because we couldn't overcome where we, you know, where, what our churches stand for. In some ways, it played out because the CRC began to go where it's gone, unfortunately. So, um, but I mean, there are odd aspects of our two backgrounds, the Dutch and Scottish traditions, even though there, there are great resonances between them, um, we s oftentimes we use different tunes to sing the same psalm. Or, and, and they're just things that, and I think you know, we need to respect the kind of customs that our churches have. That's why I like the idea of a federation, which would respect those local customs and idioms of our communions, but still have some greater form in which we could pursue the unity of the church and show that. So I'd love to see NAPARC pursue that. But it might mean NAPARC wouldn't be NAPARC anymore. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I would say not so much politics, but activism. Um, 
and uh, social reform. And I don't, I mean, the American society in the 19th century was very much, uh, very uh, decentralized. And st governments and even states didn't have the kind of power, regulatory power that they have today. So uh, one of the ways that you uh, can pursue social reforms is through these various agencies to establish institutions which in some ways regulate. They're not, they're not um, endorsed by the state necessarily, but they still they have a kind of informal power. And <clears throat> so in that way, it was kind of political, but probably more social than actual political because it didn't have state power. Now, it could, it could in some ways sway. I mean, it would matter the way people voted. So in that sense, it could have indirect uh, effects on government. But again, the American government was so uh, decentralized and, and modest at that time that it, it couldn't, it didn't have the kind of, uh, reforms just didn't have the kind of weight that they might do today if you put someone into office today and the kind of power someone might have. Yes. Um, I know Ben um, somewhat. I'm not familiar with the book, but I, I get a feel for it from its title. Do you want to say more about it, or? <laughs> right. Well, I, I mean, I think one of I'm, I'm very sympathetic to criticism of our current uh, regime, but also just criticisms of, I think America's become an empire and it's no longer a republic. Um, but, but that wasn't just the Democrats doing. Republicans contributed to that as much as anyone else, I think. So, and I'm not trying to be um, an indie. I'm actually li a registered libertarian so that I, so that I'm not uh, indie, because I don't think that is, is, is fair. But uh, having taught recently in Sunday school in our congregation on um, persecution and martyrdom in the early church, we're doing a series on Christ and culture and the way that Christians have related to culture at different points in redemptive history and church history. I mean, we're not facing anything like the early ch church faced. We're not facing anything like our brothers and sisters in Eritrea are facing, or in Egypt, or in Syria. Um, we're not, no government, it, it, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but no government is requiring us to bend the knee to um, Augustus Obama. It's just, and I don't think that would ever happen. I think American forms of government and our, and our sense of uh, kind of equality would never let that happen. Now, I could be wrong. Um, but, you know, I think we need to keep some of that in perspective. And, and so I, I, I get, I, I get uh, uncomfortable with talking about the religious aspects of our current politics, whether for good as a divine blessing or, on the other side, as some kind of curse from God. Because, I mean, I think in, in the light of all of human history, we have it really good as, as, as American Christians. Maybe too good. Maybe we're, maybe we're fat, happy, and stupid. But, um, but I, I just don't think that we're facing anything like what other saints have faced in the past or currently around the world. And I, and I, I would like to see people sort of back off on some of that rhetoric. Because I, it's, it's, I don't think it's helping the political... Uh, debates or, or discussions in the United States either. Okay, now I probably stepped in at night. Okay, time to go.